So um, accessing sexual health services is a really important part of um, supporting people's sexual health and well-being, but there hasn't really been very many targeted behaviour change interventions trying to improve access to sexual health services when there's an identified need. This is something that Warwickshire were very keen uh, on doing for their population. That's just a quick screenshot of the website when you go to it. It currently gets around 40,000 hits a month uh, from over 160 countries worldwide. So it's very well used. That's what the web app version looks like when you look at it on a computer screen. Obviously, it's optimised for, for tablets and mobiles and looks a bit different on those. I'm just going to say a few words without dwelling on this too much about the intervention development processes that we typically use. So we typically draw on a couple of systematic um, intervention development processes. One of them is the behaviour change wheel, which I'll touch on now, and we also draw on intervention mapping. Um, this project, to be honest, used a bit of both. We do draw on them as relevant, um, but just to give you a bit of a flavour and a bit of a taster, um, I've, I've basically mapped the approach that we took on this project to the behaviour change wheel to give you a bit of an insight into that. This approach has three stages, which are all about firstly understanding the target behaviour itself, broken down into four key steps, then identifying particular intervention functions that map onto that process of having understood the target behaviour you're trying to change. And then once you've done that, identifying content and implementation options for your intervention in the third stage. It's all based around Susan Mickey's uh, COMB model, um, which is a really nice, simple way of trying to understand all of the factors that might influence a particular target behaviour of interest. So just in brief, any given behaviour that you might be interested in supporting somebody to engage in is dependent on whether the people involved have the capability to perform the behaviour, whether they're motivated to perform it, and whether they have the opportunity to perform it. And each of those three things can be broken down further into both psychological and physical capability, automatic and reflective motivation, so you might be quite rational about your um, thinking and motivation towards doing something, or you might act a bit more automatically, habitually or emotionally in your responding and your motivation to do something. And opportunity can be both environmental, are there are things in the environment that are going to help or stop you from performing the behaviour, um, or are there social kind of influences that are going to have, a, a, um, have an influence on you performing that behaviour or not. And that model fits nicely within the whole framework for intervention development, behaviour change wheel. So once you've identified the particular elements that are perhaps enabling or preventing a behaviour from happening in the COMB, um, those components, once identified, can be mapped against intervention functions, policy categories, and another layer, which isn't actually illustrated in the wheel because it's too complicated, a taxonomy of behaviour change techniques. And the system supports you in using uh, an evidence and theory-based approach to identify the best content to include in your intervention. Um, it's a really strong system, it's not perfect, um, and it does still rely on there being quite a lot of artistry involved in the process as well. So you don't just get the solution deposited at your door after plugging in X, Y and Z. But it is a good, useful framework. Um, so just to quickly run through how this applies to the Respect Yourself project, we define the problem in behavioural terms. Young people experience greatest proportion of STI, termination of pregnancy, so on and so forth. Um, they need to access sexual health services when they do have that particular need. They're not always doing that, so we need to support them to do so. We could have selected, obviously, we wanted to improve sexual health and well-being of young people. There's lots of different behaviours you could target. We were particularly targeting uh, sexual health service access in this case. We want all young people in Warwickshire to access sexual health services at a time and place convenient to them of their own or with support from a friend whenever they have the need. That's a specification of the target behaviour. And in order to identify what needs to change, we reviewed the literature. There is already quite a lot of literature out there which identifies um, barriers and enablers to service access, but we also conducted our own needs analysis work with young people locally and identified um, a list of factors from that process. And you probably won't be able to read all of those things. In the blue box on the left-hand side, I'll pick out one or two to give you a flavour. So embarrassment about accessing fear or shame, Fear of being recognised by people you know accessing a sexual health service. Fear about whether you're too young to go to the sexual health service. 
um, wondering whether it's going to be free, fear of being judged by the people who, who, are, who are serving you there, who are at the uh, reception desk and so on, cost of travel, all kinds of barriers. We mapped those um, onto elements of the COMBI framework and what we found is that there's quite a lot of barriers that sit in both the automatic and reflective motivation part of the COMBI model. Uh, and those are around things like young people's beliefs about their capability of accessing services, beliefs about the consequences of accessing services, what's going to happen if I do that, and sort of emotional fear, anxiety type um, uh, responses or motivational aspects to accessing. Young people lacked a lot of psychological capability, particularly around knowledge. Where are the services? How do I access them? How do I get there? How will I know when I found this service? What does it look like from the outside? Those kinds of things. And there's quite a lot of concern around social opportunities, social influences, and what will people think of me, and so on. So we could map the barriers into those elements of the COMBI model. Um, we chose to uh, apply certain intervention functions from the behaviour change wheel, and those included education, where your primary objective is to increase knowledge and understanding. Persuasion, where you're using communication to induce positive or negative feelings or stimulate action and enablement, where you might try to increase the means or reduce barriers in order to increase capability or opportunity to perform the behaviour. Um, we chose those because they were suitable from the Combi framework perspective, thanks, um, and, but they were also feasible within this web app, uh, website mode of delivery, which was obviously part of the parameters of what we were doing. Policy categories, which is part of behaviour change, we were already identified, so we're, we're working in communications marketing as our policy categories in terms of interventions. I won't dwell on this slide too much because uh, I'm a little short on time, so we'll move on quickly. I'll pick out one of these to try uh, and illustrate um, something for you. So uh, on the left-hand side of the, that table, we've got... Um, is it about to disappear off the screen? <laughs> Thank you for rescuing my slides. Um, so on the left-hand side of this table, we've got some COMBI or um, a more detailed part of COMBI is called the Theory Domains Framework, but COMBI elements listed on the left-hand side. So um, one of the things we identified was young people's beliefs about the consequences of accessing services was a particular issue. We were targeting that using persuasion and um, by framing and reframing the beliefs. So suggesting to an individual that they can think of using services as, as a responsible and positive thing to do. So, for example, in text on the what to expect page of the website, um, we suggest that if you access emergency contraception, that's a responsible and positive thing to do for your sexual health and well-being. And we've got a fabulous video clip of a pharmacist talking about the fact that if you access emergency contraception from him, he will think of you not as being an irresponsible young person, but as being as a responsible young person who's looking after their sexual health and well-being. So kind of reframing the belief that there'll be judgment from the health professional if you access that service. Um, and then in terms of our evaluation, uh, this paper has just been published in Health Education Research. So it was a pre-post questionnaire based study and we've also included some objective service access data that we got from services um, pre-website launch versus post-website launch. The questionnaire data was collected from five schools in Coventry and Warwickshire from 287 students. Um, we were able to match 148 participants' worth of data across those two time points. Um, the young people completed the baseline questionnaires. We got them to engage with the Respect Yourself website over at least a two-month period in each case, some of them a little bit longer. Um, about two-thirds of them accessed it via laptop or PC, and about a third were using a mobile device. This is going back a few years, 2012, 2013 kind of time. So imagine we'd get more on the mobile devices now. Um, and only three of them were only using a mobile device to access. Uh, and then follow-up questionnaire data two to three months later, as I've said. We measured their intentions to access services, their self-reported service access. As I've said, the devices they used, we also looked at ease of use and usefulness. And we measured a range of psychological factors that had come out of our needs analysis work uh, around the barriers and enablers of service access. Um, so when we measured them on all of those things, we needed to refine that measure because we developed them ourselves. Um, so uh, factor analysis 
identified three uh, sort of internally reliable measures which uh, we would describe as one factor one measuring kind of trust in and the belief of the integrity of the services. Factor two is looking at um, beliefs that the services were important and normal. And factor three um, was uh, demonstrating that, um, oh sorry, factor three demonstrated, so the factor analysis showed that um, it was internally reliable after we excluded two items from it and we had four items feeding into that factor that represented negative perceptions about services and accessing them. And then we had a few beliefs that didn't fit onto those factors, so they were input into analysis as individual items. That's just those items that are means and standard deviations. When we ran the analysis, we looked at gender uh, as an independent variable, as well as looking at time one, time two, um, principally because males tend to have very different service access behavior from females. Um, men across the spectrum don't access services as much as women, and that's certainly true in relation to sexual health. Uh, ease of use and usefulness of website were rated either at the midpoint or above by the vast majority of participants. Um, this is their self-report access data. So you can see that um, by follow-up, there wasn't a huge, well, there was no significant difference in the self-report data of the females in the sample in terms of their access to sexual health services. And although the numbers are small, um, males reported a 100% increase in service access at time two compared to baseline. And then when we looked at psychological predictors, we found a completely opposite effect. Um, we had a significant main effect of time, a significant main effect of gender, and a significant interaction effect of time by gender. And when we unpicked that, we found that there were significant differences between baseline and time two on factor two, beliefs that sexual health services are important and normal, and the individual belief that services can be accessed free of charge, great. And we found, though, that there was an interaction effect um, for most of that, where females were demonstrating the improvements on those psychological variables, but males were not. So that's what our, our interaction effect was all about. Um, and because, as, as I just mentioned briefly earlier, because the intervention effect differed for females compared to males, we considered the main effect of gender as well. And that's really showing us that, um, on the whole, females are already quite positive on some things over and above um, males. Uh, I think, actually, uh, so beliefs that sexual health services are important and normal, negative perceptions relating to services and accessing them, and the individual belief that participants could access sexual health, sexual health services when they needed them. And that was a um, significant difference where but females were responding more positively. Um, about all of those things. Although males always feel more confident than females that they could access the sexual health, se sexual health services when they need. So males are much more confident than females. And then when we explored our, um, almost there, objective service access data, an interesting finding. So given that we'd seen male self-reporting uh, an increase in service access, what we found when we looked at the objective service access for the services for this particular age group um, was that two of the more deprived regions of Warwickshire were showing significant increases in service access when you compare eight months from before the website launch to the same eight months of the year afterwards. I was never able to shoehorn that data out of them by gender, so unfortunately I've not been able to look at that by gender. If I can ever get it out of them by gender, um, then I will be really, really interested to see if, if we pick up the same pattern as we did in the self-report data. But I think that for the kind of northern and eastern regions of Warwickshire, where we see more of the SDI um, transmission data being picked up, um, that was a really positive finding about the, the website and web app launch. So very, very exciting to find. Um, so positive findings, the website and the web app were liked and they were found to be useful. We did get quite a few neutral responses around that, but we were sampling. Um, young people who may not yet be sexually active, so it, it's not surprising that they may not all yet find it that useful. Females were improving on the psychological measures, males self-reports uh, self of access increased, uh, and we're seeing um, increased access for two of the most deprived areas of Warwickshire post-website launch. One of the questions we might ask is, well, why do we get that psychological difference? Uh, it may be that we need to um, present information to a, a more targeted population of potential users of sexual health services to see some more in-depth in um, kind of or, or more specific um, uh, impact on particular self-report behaviour. 
The reason we, why we got this 100% self-report increase in, in male access to sexual health services could well have been that a whole bunch of males who took part decided to go en masse to a sexual health clinic and access condoms. We don't know. Um, hopefully it wasn't that. And, and then gender differences regarding concerns about perceptions. I think there's quite an interesting finding in there uh, about females versus males in terms of the types of things we might need to tackle to support young women um, to feel confident about sexual health service access. So we're carrying on doing some more work in this area uh, and we will be conducting, well we are conducting further evaluation work as we go. We've uh, set up a licensing agreement with Warwickshire County Council um, and we're selling the, uh, the right to replicate this website to other local authorities in the country. So, so far we've sold one to Gloucestershire and one to Doncaster County Council. And that means that they are also supporting evaluation data collection and we'll be able to tell more once we've got results in from that. So Gloucestershire are just about finishing data collection now. Doncaster will start later this year and we hope other local authorities will follow suit. We've got some process evaluation type work going on at the moment with a master's student at the university doing some think aloud work so we can understand more about what's going through, through um, young people's minds when they're accessing content on the website. Uh, and as I said, cluster RCT is in progress um, in Gloucestershire and Doncaster at the moment. Um, and those are just a few stats. I mentioned a couple of them earlier about um, access um, to the website and what we're up to now. Well, that's it. I've finished there. Thanks very much for listening.